and welcome to this special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. We are your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. And this week, we are celebrating 100 episodes since our launch two years ago. I'm your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, we're looking back at some of our top interviews, hearing the vision behind this unique pro-life program and this. I think like so many young people, right, I, I didn't want anybody else to know how much I was hurting. We shared the story of an abortion attempt survivor in our first show, and we're looking back at her testimony again, 100 episodes later. EWTM Pro-Life Weekly launched our inaugural episode two years ago during 2017's March for Life Week. Throughout the course of our 100 episodes, we have interviewed top lawmakers, church officials, and pro-life influencers with the intent to inform, enlighten, and educate you, our viewers, so we can together build a culture of life. And we are joined now by two people who played a pivotal role in the creation of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Michael Warsaw is EWTN's own chairman and CEO, and Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List. I am so glad we could all be together for this special show. Oh, this is fun. We need the 100 candle birthday cake right, right here. I know. That will come out <laughs> later, right? I know. No, but thank, thank you both for being here. And this show would not be possible without the support of the Susan B. Anthony List. Can you both, Michael and Marjorie, speak to the vision behind EWTN Pro-Life Weekly? Well, I think when we first began talking about this show, you know, it was really sort of an informal conversation. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we were both convinced that, you know, there really was a gap that existed mm -hmm. um, and a gap that a show like this could fill, mm -hmm. you know, to really sort of hone in on the issues of life and mm -hmm. the challenges to life. Um, and, and in so many ways that exist in this period in, in history. Right. Um, while it might be a part of the, the discussion of other shows or news mm -hmm. items and so forth, um, I think we both felt that having a show that focused exclusively on the life issues mm -hmm. um, and one which, which issued a call to action, mm -hmm. I think that was an extremely important part yeah. of what we were trying to accomplish mm -hmm. with the creation of the show. Mm -hmm. um, we felt all of that was really, really important in a, in a particular way at this time in, in history. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah, it was very complimentary. As soon as we started talking, we were both like, yeah, 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 let's, let's keep moving this forward. Um, I've worked in this town mm, a few decades. My husband and I both have in di different branches of government, in associations, in other places. For me, Susan B. Anthony List has been the yeah. pro-life work of my life. But it, this came from um, a love of the church, a knowledge of EWTN, but a little bit from afar mm -hmm. and thinking, how do we uh, collapse the distance between Washington, D.C., your elected representatives, and home? Mm -hmm. It really should be that way for a citizen activist, for a citizen lobbyist, to have that access to all those people that are making all those decisions, the people that I've been working with, the senators and the congressmen, and now people in the administration. They're just a lot of really great leaders and great friends that I thought, I just want to be able to um, have a way to introduce them to, to the best people in the country. And, it, and it, Michael's like, okay, let's do it. It's <laughs> so unique for a movement to have its own television show. Yeah. Um, Michael, I never had the opportunity to meet our foundress, Mother Angelica. I know that you were close with her, and we actually found this old clip of Mother Angelica speaking about the pro-life issue in voting. Let's take a look. Should we really vote for anyone? One year I voted for Jesus. I didn't know what to vote for. I said, write in vote. So I put Jesus. <laughs> He's the only one I thought could make it and would do a good job. <laughs> but that was the last vote, I was told. OK, so should you vote? Oh, yes, you should. Does it matter who we vote for? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to vote for candidates. I vote for life. <sighs> Mother was really passionate about the pro-life issue. Absolutely, absolutely. I remember that show while I was there, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, as I was often for Mother's, mm -hmm. Mother's live shows through the years. Um, 
No, mother was mother was an incredibly outspoken, uh, you know, incredibly clear uh, advocate for life at all mm -hmm. stages. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, I think she, because of the suffering that she had in her life, I think from the time mm -hmm. she was a child to her last days on earth, mm -hmm. she suffered, and she knew the value of suffering. And I think she understood because of that the value of every human life, mm -hmm. that every life regardless of stage, regardless of the difficulties, the challenges, every life has meaning and value mm -hmm. in the eyes of God. And, and I think that compelled her to be this extraordinary voice when there weren't a lot of voices often, mm -hmm. uh, that extraordinary voice for life. Marjorie, we work with the Susan B. Anthony list each and every week to determine that call to action that mm -hmm. Michael referenced earlier. Um, why is that so important? And from what you're hearing, is it making an impact? No, well, there's absolutely it's making an impact. I think right now we're really reaping the benefits of the fact that this show has been continually communicating with people across the country. Right now we're seeing the horror of mm -hmm. state legislatures embracing late-term abortion even in fantasize mm -hmm. and in New York the celebration of it over the uh, memorial of deaths of little children that were killed in 9-11. Um, what's happening now is that there are people all over the country really riveted on this question and on this on this horror and they want to know what to do with that right. and that's why she's so right that, god that's so beautiful i don't vote for candidates i vote for life mm. so our radar ought to be oriented towards where is life right now that's the debate that is happening now that is the thing that we can have an impact on and looking at some of the numbers from the call to action that our viewers They're have amazing. taken over 20 3,000 submitted comments in support of the Protect Life rule, over 11,000 in support of the abortion surcharge transparency, you know, calls to confirm pro-life justices. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, as the Global Catholic Network, what is our responsibility in speaking up in defense of life? Well, I think, I think that's innately tied to mm -hmm. what our mission is. You know, I, I think it's... it's uh, it's our responsibility to be that voice, to mm -hmm. be that voice on a global basis. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Mother Angelica would uh, be very, very proud of this show. Mm -hmm. I think she'd be very, very proud of, of what you've been able to accomplish with the show and what you've done with the mm -hmm. show. To be that weekly voice, the weekly voice that's shining light on the evil that mm -hmm. is happening, you mm -hmm. know, to, to make people aware of that and being a clear and consistent voice for mm -hmm. life. You know, I think uh, we're mother with us in this time uh, in particular. Um, you know, I think she would have, uh, in her own fashion, <laughs> yeah, uh, very uh, clear and unequivocal words about so-called self-described Catholic politicians mm. uh, who uh, do what they do. Uh, you know, she had no time and no tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's that's continues to be the voice of the network. Mm -hmm. That continues to be the reason for this show. Mm. Thank you for those words and for your continued support. Marjorie, you've been with us most weeks here. Uh, mm. Have you had a favorite moment? Is there a highlight for you? Well, I, I have to say that the call to action part is my favorite because mm -hmm. I'm at heart an activist. You know? yeah. um, so that's always been my favorite. Um, I honestly, my favorite part is just honestly... Uh, our back and forth on mm -hmm. the set, getting to know you. I, mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in your leadership. You didn't expect me to say this. Mm -hmm. I know that you've been put here for a purpose and for this mm -hmm. time, and this show okay. is really essential to that. Thank I'm really you. proud of you. Well, I'm so grateful for both of your supports. And as we look back on 100 episodes, um, what are your hopes for these next 100 episodes as we continue <laughs> on? Um, there is a lot ahead of us. It's very, very concrete mm -hmm. on, a, on a natural level, and it's also very, very important on a spiritual level these next yeah. couple of years when we move into who's going to be our next president. Um, will Roe versus Wade be overturned? Mm -hmm. If it is, all of those state battles that will be engaged to fight for life, our job it will be multiplied many, many, many times. I see this show as part of the preparation for a beautiful mm -hmm. springtime for life. Mm -hmm. I pray so. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think uh, the challenges to life uh, continue. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're not they're not getting fewer; they're getting mm -hmm. more and more frequent. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, my hope is certainly that the show continues to be as it has been. Uh, a voice for those who are voiceless, mm. uh, and and a challenge to people to, you know, sort of 
get up off the sofa right. mm -hmm. and, and to really become engaged That's on right. this. Um, and, and, you know, to really focus their efforts in whatever way they can. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the things that we hoped for in the beginning was that mm -hmm. this show would motivate people who maybe hadn't been involved in the pro-life movement in any way. Mm -hmm. Even people who are homebound, you know, right. to, to, to realize that you can be a part of this fight. You can raise your voice. You can pray. Mm. There are all of these things that you can do. And, and I, I think as we go forward, uh, to the next hundred shows and the next thousand shows mm -hmm. and the next mm -hmm. ten thousand wow. shows, uh, I think that's what that's what I hope for is that we'll continue to be the clear and consistent voice for life. Excellent. Every voice matters. Every yeah. voice matters. <laughs> Michael Warsaw, Marjorie Danenfelser, thank you so much for being here and for your support and for getting this show off the ground. Thank, thank you. Such thank you. Blessing. Each and every week on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, we share a call to action. It's a simple way you can get involved in the pro-life movement to make a difference. To find out the latest call to action, all you have to do is go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly launched just after Donald Trump was inaugurated president of the United States. We know it's our responsibility to hold the administration accountable to its pro-life promises and to press lawmakers so pro-life policies are prioritized policies. Take a look. Sarah, President Trump also campaigned on repealing the contraceptive mandate in Obamacare, which requires employers to provide contraception. When can we expect to see that repeal happen so religious groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor aren't forced to violate their conscience? Look, the president's made no secret that health care reform and certainly repealing and replacing Obamacare is one of his top priorities. That's something that he and his administration and the team are working on constantly day in, day out. And we hope to see that get uh, finished and completed here in the coming weeks. How much, Senator, of a priority are the pro-life protections in our health care to you? Would you vote for a plan that didn't both A, prevent the taxpayer funding of abortion and B, defund Planned Parenthood? Well, I think that uh, any of our policies here that deal with appropriation should always have hide protections. We should not be providing taxpayer funding of abortions on the uh, on Planned Parenthood, as Speaker of the House, I uh, supported measures to defund Planned Parenthood in the state. I think that we need to make sure that we communicate to the American people that that's not defunding women's health. It's actually putting that money equivalent and sometimes more sums of money in community health clinics that provide uh, mammography and all the kinds of things that uh, women's health clinics can provide. And that's my next question, Mercedes, because during his March for Life address at the Rose Garden, President Trump called on the Senate to vote on the paying capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which is that bill you are referencing that would ban abortions after five months of pregnancy. How much of a priority is this bill to the administration? Well, clearly, I mean, it's up to the Senate here to pass that bill. And as we know, the Senate makeup right now is not as favorable to those uh, who really have fought so hard for this bill. Uh, it is why the president will continue to be uh, working to, to make sure that we get more Republicans in the Senate and more like-minded Republicans in the Senate who are pro-life, who believe that this is important, and also to get this bill passed. Obviously, you're going to need 60 votes to make that happen in the Senate. We obviously fall very short of that in the Senate. And for the president, it's, he wants the Senate to take action on this bill. From pressing top pro-life lawmakers and politicians on policies, we also had the chance to get personal with them and hear what it is that drives these leaders on the pro-life issue. How did you come to be so passionate about this issue? Well, you know, it was experience, a whole set of experiences. Um, first, perhaps, was an experience I had in my early 20s, uh, right here in Washington, D.C., actually. I had a very good friend who decided she was going to have an abortion. And despite my talking with her, she was adamant about this. And so we went to a Planned Parenthood clinic. I observed that she was given no options. There was no conversation about whether or not this was the right thing for her and what her other alternatives might be. Uh, it was a callous, 
experience, and I saw the impact of that abortion on her, not just physically, but emotionally and especially spiritually. Honestly, she was never the same since. I want to turn now, Governor, to your personal pro-life views and your family's witness. Can you give us some insight into you and your wife's journey into becoming adoptive parents? When did that journey begin? Sure. I mean, it's, there's a lot of moving parts to any life story, uh, and ours is a large family. We have nine children. Uh, four of them are adopted. We initially had five children. We decided to adopt one child. We did start that process, and indeed, in the course of adopting him, uh, we learned of a sibling group of three others. Mm. They were siblings with one another. Uh, they didn't have a home. They were 10, 7, and 2. So the fact that they were older children, three together, it wasn't likely they would find a home. And once you already have six children, you know, six, nine, what's the difference? There's plenty of your viewers who appreciate this. Nine is a warm-up to some of the people that are watching this program. Congressman, you have a busy life here on Capitol Hill, how do you lean on your Catholic faith? I'm curious, do you have a special devotion or a specific saint that you frequently turn to for intercession? Uh, well, certainly during this, uh, this, this past primary, uh, I had uh, a few people uh, tell me to, uh, to ask uh, St. Joseph to, uh, mm -hmm. to pray for me, and uh, certainly uh, you know, St. John Paul II. And I want to speak more to that. You, you are a devout Christian, and I think, you know, these past few months probably didn't go as expected, but <laughs> how do you see God's hand in your life right now? I know that He, he has me. You know, He has me in His hand. Uh, the Bible tells us. He just holds us in the palm of His hand, and disappointments come along. That's a part of life. And we have to learn to just turn our eyes and our prayers to God and ask Him to heal the wounds, the hurts, and that we know he will do that and he'll put us in a really good place if we just follow his directions. Our show isn't completely political though. We know we need both politics and culture on our side in order to better uphold the sanctity of life. And that's why we also turn to a variety of pro-life influencers in our culture for their insight on this issue. And you mentioned you are retired now, but can you give us some insight into what it was like to be pro-life and Catholic in the NFL? Was the football culture supportive of that? There's not a ton of Catholics, um, but, okay. but tons of Christians. Okay. Football is actually a very spiritual game. Hmm. Um, I mean, even from its beginnings, but if you think about football, football is very dangerous. Um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the NFL, right, you have these high highs and low lows. And so a, a lot of guys, if they're, if they're not... If they're not close to Jesus when, when, they, when they get to the NFL, a lot, of them, a lot of them find God there. You and I have both only lived in a post-Roe v. Wade world where women are encouraged to say, my body, my choice. But how does that affect the way we as women view our bodies? Right. Well, I think, number one, it pits women against women, too. Hmm. It's my body, my, my choice. And so we want to completely sever the connection with the sexual act, with procreation, with hmm. the fact that, like, uh, it actually could produce another person. My hmm. body, my choice doesn't hold up. Ben, because you're known for your ability to answer tough questions, we thought we'd do a quick rapid-fire Q&A with you on common abortion claims our viewers might face. How does that sound? Sure, sounds good. All right, claim one, abortion is only 3% of Planned Parenthood's business, and they do a lot of good for women. Your response? Yeah, so, that, okay, so number one, that's not true. As far as 3% of their, their business, supposedly the idea is that 3% of all services provided by Planned Parenthood uh, are abortions, but they include in those services things like handing out condoms, uh, things like regular screenings. Uh, the fact is that of the actual operations performed by Planned Parenthood, 90, something like 95% of all of those operations are, are are done by Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood provides 300 to 400,000 abortions a year. So it, it all depends on the metric that you're using, but to suggest that Planned Parenthood is not in the abortion business is simply false. As we work to build up a culture of life, it's critical that we recognize the inherent dignity in each and every human being, no matter which stage in life, no matter the ability or disability. The Mason Light Program provides a post-secondary education for students with a variety of intellectual and developmental disabilities. 
There are approximately 50 students supported by about 100 staff members. While the classroom is diverse, the students and alumnus we interviewed happen to all have Down syndrome and are all Catholic. I love being Catholic so much. It's kind of so important. Upon meeting them, it's clear these young adults dream big. My biggest dream is to become a pop star. I want to become a Hollywood film director. My dream is to be an illness. Tatiana drew a picture one day of a little boy who had a prosthetic leg like hers. And she brought it to us and said, one day I'm going to make a friend that looks like me. We didn't know where we were going to find that little friend. <laughs> so her big sister did some research and found camp. That camp they discovered is Camp No Limits. Here. Here, kids without limbs, either from an accident or from birth, can just be kids. I've always um, wondered whether I was just alone with, with my condition. But um, Camp No Limits has helped me realize that there's a lot of kids out there like me, and it's just a really amazing camp. Seven-year-old Logan agrees. So when I was born, I, I was missing a, 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 a bone. So, um, so me and my family tried every doctor. Yeah, our doctor um, said that, uh, that I needed prosthetics. So they cut it out in my feet because it had no bones in it. Camp No Limits um, is helping me make new friends. Frank, finally, if there's someone watching, if their parents and they're expecting a baby with Down syndrome, what would you want to tell them? I would tell them, congratulations. That. And to expect happiness mm -hmm. and success. And to learn to slow down and experience the joy. When we come back, I've always loved her, but my love for her deepens year after year. An abortion attempt survivor meets her biological mother for the first time. Stay tuned as our special 100 episode edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. To our special edition of EWTN Pro Life Weekly as we mark 100 episodes. I'm your host, Katherine Hedro. I want to take a quick moment and reflect on our first 100 EWTN Pro Life Weekly episodes. It's a great honor to host this show and to be a part of a movement that works to protect human life at all stages. Each and every week, we work hard to bring you the pro life news from a Catholic perspective. And when you think about it, it's an incredibly unique initiative. I mean, what other movement has its own TV show? It's a reflection that this network is committed to protecting the sanctity of life. And while we've received positive feedback throughout our two years and 100 episodes, we've also ruffled some feathers. NARAL, a major abortion lobby group, listed EWTN Pro-Life Weekly first under anti-choice media in a 2018 report. And the filmmakers behind a pro-abortion Netflix documentary, Reversing Roe, included a clip of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly in the film. To me, that shows we're reaching people who need to hear our life-affirming message. And it shows the difference this program makes and the difference you make. For our next 100 episodes, let's continue to prick the conscience of those advocating for abortion. Let's continue to be a light in the world and together be a voice for the voiceless. Finally, as we conclude every episode, we go now to our pro-life focus, the segment that highlights the hope and goodness in the pro-life movement. This was the pro-life focus story, which aired on our first show. It's a story that is one of our most watched online and an especially powerful testimony today, as more and more lawmakers are advocating for extreme late-term abortion laws. Here's the story of abortion attempt survivor Melissa Odin. Weighing less than three pounds, Melissa Odin was born beating the odds. 
She is a survivor of a failed saline infusion abortion. God did have a plan. It's a procedure that injects a toxic salt solution into the amniotic fluid surrounding a preborn child. Cared for by NICU nurses at first, baby Melissa was soon adopted into a loving home. Now, Odin is a wife and mother, a Catholic convert, and a pro-life advocate, with speeches spanning from pregnancy centers to, to Capitol Hill. I'm here today to share my story to not only highlight the horror of abortion taking place at Planned Parenthood, but to give a voice to other survivors like me. It's a journey detailed in her new memoir, You Carried Me, released this month. Melissa recounts a series of tough truths, including when she, as a teenager, learned about the abortion attempt on her life. To be 14 years old, it, it absolutely devastated my life. And I think like so many young people, right, I, I didn't want anybody else to know how much I was hurting. The focus of the memoir continues onto Melissa's search for her birth mother as she wonders whose blood runs through my veins. She discovers her birth mother was a 19-year-old college student pressured to get an abortion. She thought Melissa had been dead for over 30 years. Odin's perspective throughout the journey is strikingly compassionate. Tell us how you came to have that approach. It's a response that I think has deepened over time. Uh, I've always loved her, but my love for her deepens year after year. Uh, and not just because the circumstances of her life and mine are, are now different, right? I know the truth about how she was forced into that abortion. But I think the older I get, the, the more I learn how to love people and respect them for who they are. And I think motherhood has been a bond that she and I can really connect uh, on that level. And um, so it's a love story, right? It's, it's a love story that, that God wrote and man attempted to, to rewrite that whole story. And God, God's story wins in the end. Melissa, thank you again for your courage and vulnerability and sharing your story. And stay tuned next week as Melissa Odin is set to join us again this time to react to all of the news surrounding late-term abortion and how babies who survive abortions are treated. But for now, that does it for this special 100th episode edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Thank you for being a part of our first 100, and I hope you'll join us for the next. Until next time, you can email me at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or like my public page on Facebook. Just look for Katherine Hadro. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless. <laughs>